Okay, great. Um, so, hello everyone, uh, GM and I guess uh, G afternoon for the past nine minutes. Um, so, a few, uh, about a couple of years ago, I uh, wrote this post called um, Endgame, where I basically uh, pointed out that a, I, I basically pointed out that a bunch, uh, a lot of the different blockchain scaling paths that people were thinking about, including layer one scaling, including different forms of uh, la different forms of layer two scaling, um, if you uh, like push all of those paths to their limit, and if you add the kinds of scaffolding that you need to like actually make them sane from a decentralization and censorship resistance perspective, they actually end up in a surprisingly similar place, right? Basically, yeah, a place where you get centralized, what I called block production, though I think it's also actually possible to think of it as being something that's much more um, restricted than, uh, than production. Then you have decentralized validation, um, and uh, you have strong anti-censorship protection, right? Um, so this is a post that came out about over two years ago. Um, and it's, you know, since then, I think uh, we've gone a lot from theory to practice. And one of the ways that I yeah, think about like how a lot of these things look like in practice is basically that like how Ethereum scales is an industrial organization problem as much as it is a technical one, right? So even if the same pieces get built, different choices in who builds them can lead to big differences in outcome. So analogy, the efficient way to serve food at scale across a country is to have many locations. In each location, food gets made in a central kitchen and people can come and order it. Who people, how many people here have been to one of those in the past year? Okay, not many hands raised, interesting. Um, um, but, uh, but, you know, but is each location a branch or a franchise, right? Branch is like commands and control, like arranged from the top down. Franchise is like, you know, anyone can come in and say, you know, yo dog, I have a location, I'm, I'll pay a fee and like I wanna use your logo and serve your stuff. Um, so there's, um, you know, this is a yeah, kind of sub-discipline in um, economics and I you know it can really yeah, like try to explicitly think about the trade-offs of like, even if the same kinds of pieces get made, like what are the actual consequences of uh, different pieces that are happening? Um, so going through a few examples of this, right? So first example is the state transition function, right? So state transition function is basically just, uh, you know, if Ethereum scales, then like, you know, you need to have lots and lots of transactions. And uh, with, with a lot of these uh, transactions are being processed by a set of rules. And I uh, you know these rules uh, talk about how accounts work, how smart contracts work, and so on and so forth. And these, uh, like, these rules have to be enforced somewhere, right? Now, Ethereum for the last few years has had this uh, roll-up scaling, a uh, roll-up centric roadmap where basically Ethereum as a blockchain provides shared security and it provides um, data scalability um, through things like uh, EIP 4844, which um, you know, we're gonna have in I guess about 25 hours. Um, then, and you have rollups, which are these layer two protocols that actually handle execution and uh, all of that infrastructure on top, right? Now, theoretically, you can achieve the exact same outcome by basically just like having a big system that has kind of monolithic sh like shards inside the protocol, right? And there are other platforms that do this. In the case of uh, Ethereum, in like realistic possible futures, right? I think uh, there's basically three that I can think of. And uh, one of, basically one is, um, you know, you have different rollups and each of those rollups makes their own highly customized state transition function and like this is like, a major basis for people to compete with each other, right? So, you know, you have Fuel, which has like been stage two for a while and deserves praise for that. You have Arbitrum and Arbitrum Stylus. Then, um, you know, you have the whole StarkNet ecosystem and, uh, you know, Cairo and their proof-based VMs. You might have even more in the future. Another option is basically rollups generally reuse the EVM. And a third option is like rollups use a hypothetical Ethereum layer one EVM precompile, right? So this is a yeah, post that I wrote about a few months ago that basically talks about this idea that like maybe 
Ethereum should include a ZK EVM pre-compile as part of its uh, kind of layer one functionality, right? And if we do that, then basically, yeah, like it comes much closer to a world where we we have what was called sharding like ten years ago, um, and uh, you know, including execution sharding. But uh, you know, like as a roll-up, you're basically yeah, you know responsible for spinning up your own shard. And um, you know, if you do a good job of um, attracting applications to your shard, then uh, you know, you get to collect the yeah, priority fees in your shard and um, you, know, you get to make money that way. Um, but uh, th these are like very, yeah, like from a technological perspective, there's a lot of similarities, but from a perspective of like who builds it, um, you, know, you have a bunch of different consequences, right? So like for example, if rollups make their own STF, you have more, more options for users, faster iteration in VM technology, cons are greater software bug risk, more confusing for users, if you want to make it easier to understand for users, then like fine, everyone uses the EVM. But uh, in you know you have somewhat less uh, bug risk, but you still have some risk of bugs, but also less room for creativity. If you don't want bug, uh, if you want to like really minimize the uh, risk of bugs uh, losing your money, then Ethereum L1 EVM precompile can do that. Basically, the more you enshrine, the less there is a, the, the less application code attack service there even is. There's also no need for rollups to have governance because they just kind of automatically upgrade when Ethereum um, upgrades. But there are trade-offs. So like in this case, there's actually efficiency trade-offs. I'm um, like, uh, Enshrined ZKVMs do involve like some actual technical sacrifices, right? And I am also talked about them in the post, right? So you have these different um, options, and like they actually have some interestingly different um, consequences. But some, a lot of these consequences, like they don't appear on you know usual axes like scalability versus decentralization. They appear on like these weird new axes that we think less about, like. Uh, speed of innovation of different things, um, you know, like risk of software bugs, um, and the extent to which like, different pieces of the system need to have governance, right? So like, for example, if you're the sort of person who loves the idea of Ethereum ossifying and you're totally afraid of Ethereum, governance doing crazy things in 2029, then, you know, going up to the next two columns and especially the top column is good for you. But if you're the sort of person who actually believes off-chain governance is best and you're afraid of any of these weird gadgets that are inside of layer twos, then like the bottom thing is actually best. Um, Sequencing, right? So procedure for determining which transactions go in the next roll up block. So independent sequencing, every roll up does it for itself. Shared sequencing as layer as a piece of layer two infrastructure, and then you know you have based sequencing and like you know all of these uh, Drakean ideas that try to like you know bring <laughs> layer one and layer two together. Um, yeah, and. Uh, like if you if you look at just kind of you know like what the uh, trade offs of uh, some of these are, I think, uh, I mean between independent and shared, like the big difference is basically if you do independent, then like you get a risk that shared sequencing happens anyway through side channels, and then if you do shared sequencing, then like there's greater risk that I um, mean you know, there's. Um, like e some kind of eco ecosystem-wide monopolization. Um, if shared sequencing is a layer two infrastructure, there's a risk of shared sequencing protocols becoming rent extractors. If uh, you do it at layer one, then you have like a different risk, which is that if something weird happens at that layer, then like you get more risk spilling over onto layer one, right? Um, so. Actually, yeah, this was something I yeah, also wrote briefly about in my yeah, post kind of almost uh, two years ago on uh, April 1st, uh, praising Bitcoin maximalism. And uh, I basically talked about how like the, the thing about Bitcoin simplicity that makes sense is not like the technical simplicity of the VM, because like you can make the VM way more performance with only a tiny bit more technical complexity. It's like having applications is bad, right? And the reason why having applications is bad is because applications create weird stuff like MEV and the effect and the centralizing effects of MEV spill, spill over to the base layer. And like if we basically if we want Ethereum itself to be maximally protected from all that, then like you have sequencing be very far away so that whatever centralization, whatever weirdness happens, like that gets collected by outside actors and whatever gets pushed onto L1 is like becomes relatively time independent, right? So like that's one example of an economic incentive. I mean then of course the flip side is like, you know, who like which of these protocols actually gets to collect the MEV. And this is one of those trade-offs between, you know, like basically yeah, sequencing being based and uh, sequencing happening at some higher level, right? 
So from a technological perspective, you get similar things happening, but a lot of the consequences, again, are economic. Um, they're about like codependency, what, what, like whether you're basically leaning on you know, like L1 or kind of doing things separately from, um, from L1 and these kinds of issues. Um, a proof aggregation, right? So rollups need to publish proofs to chain. Um, a proof is about 500,000 gas or something like 5 million gas if you're a Stark. This is a lot. It would be really amazing if every rollup could just publish a, a, an update every block. Um, but you know, at this point, there, it feels like everybody is just launching a rollup, and so we probably have like more than 60, like 30 rollups at this point, and so we have like too many for the gas limit if they want to publish every block. But the status quo is that every rollup figures it out for themselves. Simplest code, minimum trust dependency is high gas cost, but. What if we have like aggregation protocols, right? Basically, instead of 20 rollups publishing 20 snarks to chain, you like pub somehow publish one snark to chain, right? And like we have aggregation protocols, and there's like different ways in which this could happen, right? So like one way in which this could happen is you have Ethereum ecosystem-wide proof aggregation. So basically, you have a protocol where rollups can opt into this, where Basically, they submit their proofs to into a mempool, and then it's the role of builders in the mempool to just like take these proofs and then make a proof of the proofs, and then publish a proof of the proofs along with the state roots, and then a contract just like makes one call for each rollup, and you only need one proof, right? So, very good gas savings, some level of opinionated choices, some amount of tr of uh, shared interested code. Another way in which a very similar thing is happening already is like we're seeing aggregation within ecosystems, right? So like StarkNet has their own aggregation. You have like layer threes, and then the layer threes commit into layer two, the layer twos commit into layer one. And so ultimately there's like one proof, and so you get the same effect of like proofs inside proofs. Um, and, but, um, you know, this, like if this is a thing that individual uh, roll-up ecosystems do um, separately, then like this is good for large ecosystems, but it's less good for small ecosystems, and like you have to deal with more trusted code. Um, account abstraction and uh, key stores is another one, right? Basically, yeah. So, you know, we have wallets and. Uh, one very basic security property that's sort of like considered totally standard in regular cybersecurity is like you want to be able to expire keys, right? Like you want keys that are contr that control an account before to no longer control an account later. This is something that EOAs do not do, and it's like one of the five fundamental reasons why, in the long term, EOAs need to die, right? Um, so, the yeah, but if you have some account abstraction based uh, setup, then Basically, yeah, the like you have to store the information somewhere of like things like which keys currently have the right to process transactions from an account, right? And the question is like, well, where does this data get stored? Um, so the status quo is basically if you have a smart contract wallet, you have a, you have a copy of that smart contract wallet on every single L2, right? And this is like simplest, very, fairly simple code, fairly minimal trust dependencies, but then. There are also obvious costs, right? And the cost is like, well, if you change the keys in one place, then like, are the keys still going to change in all the other places, right? And like, you have high gas cost of changing all the keys around in different places, and there's also a risk that like you'll just accidentally forget somewhere, right? It's like you have a Gnosis safe, and like you know you you change your keys in like three different places, but then you just totally forgot that you have the, the, a copy of the same safe somewhere else, and then you forget to change the keys, and then two years later, like one at a time, the old key holders get hacked, or like you know like someone else uh, kind of goes after them, or they yeah, like you know they think that everyone else forgot about them, and they just like go and steal the money, and so. Basis. So there's like cons of the current approach, right? Um, there, are in a very natural approach is well, instead of having like that data live in live in every place, we'll have the data live in one place, right? So like either use L1, but L1 is a bit too expensive. Like use some L2 to store this information of like which keys currently have the right to access some account. One idea that I talk about is like this minimal key store rollup proposal, right? Basically, you create like this very minimalistic roll rollup whose only function it is is to like store this uh, account related logic and to store the rules for updating it. So, basically, trying to keep the thing pretty simple, trying to keep trust dependencies pretty low, um, requiring some standardization. Um, 
It really, it's, uh, and then if you want to update your account, then you'd only have to update it in one place. And then basically every time you sign your transaction, like that transaction would include a uh, SNARK that proves the current status of your account. Um, and this is something that is going to become cheap in the future because we have proof, ag proof aggregation, but like there's still a question of like, you know, who builds it, right? Another option is, of course, we just kind of like let users pick, you know, like base their accounts on whatever chain they want, and uh, like you, you just like put your key store there, right? You you put like this, you store the logic of you know who is allowed to access your account on just like whatever chain you want, and like different users do it differently. There's like tech blow up risk here, right? So you have like an n squared tech blow up because you might have like n different types of proofs for n different rollups. You have more trust dependencies, but on the other hand, it's like it requires this like less shared infrastructure, and it's the sort of thing that's maybe more likely to happen anyway by default, right? So, like you have approaches that are very similar, but then you have like differences in practice depending on you know like, who does it, right? Um, so, the I guess you know the conclusion of all these different things, right, is basically that uh, you know there like once you start getting into the weeds, there is like a lot of these uh, choices about like which actors are actually uh, responsible for which pieces, right? And if you go back to the endgame post and uh, you know you think about how from a technological perspective, right, all of the different uh, things like feel like they're lining they're lining up toward the yeah, same conclusion. But what's what's the big difference between, let's say, yeah, you know, what I call kind of, you know, an ideal L2 scaling future versus like what I would call, you know, like ideal Solana, where you actually have, uh, you know, like state consensus nodes uh, being able to run, uh, to, to run on laptops and have sensitive inclusion channels and have Starks for everything. Well, the, you know, the answer is basically like you have this boundary of, you know, like which actors are responsible for building and maintaining which parts of the ecosystem and what their incentives are. And across all of these different areas, like the difference uh, between those things matters a lot, right? Um, so basically, you know, you have two separate questions, right? There's always the tech arrangement, and then who is responsible for building and maintaining what? Um, and probably the biggest actors that we have are like one is independent layer two teams, another is um, basically standards groups. Um, you know, so you have the uh, roll-up improvement uh, proposal group. You know, you have EIPs, you have ERCs potentially more standardization in the future, and then you have L1 core protocol teams, right? And, and depending on you know, like which of these uh, pieces gets res uh, is uh, responsible for building things, like you, uh, you start to have some, some different consequences. Um, I think the main axes on which the consequences are different on all of these is like basically, uh, you know, like one, you know, who has the incentive to build the thing? Two, is there some incentive, like, is there an incentive for people to like try to get some a, a, a monopoly and like start extracting rent from the thing? Um, three, kind of where does the code bug risk lie and like, you know, and how much? Uh, risk of code bugs is there, and probably about a couple of uh, other questions, right? Um, and so I think uh, in a lot of these questions that we have in the future, like it's going to be a similar thing, right? It's like even if the, uh, you know, the final outcome is uh, the same, like the path for getting there sort of also defines, I mean, like these boundaries between what kind of actor is responsible for what, and uh, this will decide a lot of the details. Yeah. Yeah.